Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today we're looking at the 2011 to 2014 series Batman: The Dark Knight, part of DC's The New 52. By 2011, artist David Finch had grown to be a pretty big name in the comic book industry. He started out on indies, but quickly moved to working for Marvel, most notably on The Avengers with Brian Michael Bendis during Avengers Disassembled, which I've covered on the channel, and the subsequent new Avengers that followed out of it. Following the return of Bruce Wayne's story arc, Finch would come to work for DC on a Batman title called Batman The Dark Knight, where he served as both writer and penciler. Believe it or not, that's not the comic we're looking at today. Because thanks to Flashpoint, that series would be brought to an abrupt end after only five issues so that the new 52 could begin. That could have been the end of it, but rather than abandon Finch, they decided to restart the title following the new 52 reboot. Finch would only write this new series for nine of its issues, but he does continue as penciler until issue 15 at which point a number of other artists would finish off the series, primarily including Ethan Van Syver and Alex Malayev. Greg Hurwitz, meanwhile, would take over writing duties at issue 10 and continue as writer for the rest of the series, giving the series a remarkably consistent throughline that is quite unique to the new 52. But now I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I start criticizing, let's see what happens in this fifth new 52 Batman series and take this away. The comic opens on Batman, who's very late for an important date. You'll see why I made that reference in a second, but it is true. He's hurrying to get to a speech he's supposed to make, even though the narration boxes have already been running through that speech, which Bruce finishes after making his quick change from his vigilante suit to his billionaire suit. The speech is all about fear, and Bruce claims he refuses to be afraid, and then the speech just ends. I'm not really sure the point he was trying to make here. I mean, the theme is relevant to our first two story arcs, but there's no clear point to his speech and we're not told what event this is that he's attending. Instead, it weirdly just seems to be a reference to the New 52 Batman title, which started basically the exact same way. And there's even a direct mention of Bruce's Gotham revitalization plan that was the point of the speech Bruce gave in that opening, which was an important setup for the entire series following it. Kind of strange to open this comic in the exact same way, but not have the same reason for doing so. But maybe I'm just being nitpicky here. After all, there is a point to them showing us Bruce at this event, and that's to introduce us to a couple of characters. First is GCPD Internal Affairs Officer Lieutenant Forbes, who is investigating Batman Incorporated and its ties to Commissioner Gordon, and will absolutely be a lame duck that barely even appears again after this. He'll be in Batman Eternal, though, so maybe he's largely just here to help set up that. Their talking like this competition is interrupted by our second new character, Jaina Hudson, who also won't have a very large impact, but she is a lady and Brucey likey. He's back in his bat suit again before long, though, because there's been a breakout at Arkham Asylum giving us this sweet double-page spread of villains, including many making their new 52 debut right here. And many of those won't really even be seen again during the new 52. I mean, of course we'll see more of Mr. Freeze and Clayface, and if you've watched my Batgirl video, you probably know Ragdoll here shows up to threaten her, but that's really about it for these characters. Batman surmises that this breakout is just a distraction to get Two-Face out, and so he heads deeper into the asylum to try and find that villain, but instead runs across a lady. Another lady. This is the White Rabbit, because Gotham clearly didn't have enough Wonderland-themed villains yet and Finch apparently thought he was working for Xenoscope instead of DC. The White Rabbit immediately disappears, and Two-Face appears, looking like he's been working out a bit. Just a bit. With his giant new muscles, Two-Face brings the pain to Batman, right up until the point that he starts bleeding from his eyeballs and just collapses. Whatever drug Two-Face was on to bulk him out is soon given to plenty of other Gotham baddies, leading to this montage of our various Bat Family heroes having to deal with them. My favorite of which is the Ventriloquist, who gets extra creepy when he throws away his Scarface puppet in exchange for using the dead body of a police officer as his new dummy. That is effing terrifying, and I love it. 
Batman heads to a train where the Joker has been spotted, and here again runs across the White Rabbit, whose demand that he chase her somewhat echoes Jaina's request earlier to Bruce that he catch her. What's that you say? Could the new female character be the new female villain? Surely not! Well, Bruce will certainly think so, and he goes on a date later with Jaina, only to have Alfred report that at the same time the White Rabbit is spotted across town. So are you convinced? No. Oh. You must have read a comic book before. Anyway, as for the Joker on the train, he is also buffed out. It's hard not to feel like this entire story arc was being done simply as a reference to Batman Arkham Asylum. I mean, it's possible. The point that we're at here is in between Joker cutting off his face in Detective Comics number one and returning for Death of the Family. So Batman realizes that this Joker is a fake. Just Clayface in disguise. Which actually could be another Arkham game reference, but given the timing that would require, it might just be a huge coincidence. Bat's apparently called in Flash to help out, and Barry arrives just in time to be no help at all. Typical Barry. But after analyzing the substance causing this hulking out of his villains, Batman discovers that it comes from a rare plant and suspects Poison Ivy. So the two head off to investigate her lab. There, Flash gets pricked by a thorn. A sentence that I hope doesn't demonetize my video. And worried that this eye-bleeding serum will affect him too, he runs off to try and keep it from metabolizing. Ivy isn't in the lab anyway, but Bruce tracks her down to an island off the coast where he finds Scarecrow, who gives him a blast of his new fear toxin, which is laced with the same drug used to beef up all these villains. This causes Bats to freak out and even attack Superman when he comes to help. But that fight causes Batman to go into overdrive and burns the drug out of his system before it can do real damage. Batman tells Supes to find Flash and help him do the same thing, as he's still running around the Earth from earlier, while Bats goes chasing after the White Rabbit some more. This leads Batman to the real villain behind all of this, not Scarecrow like he was thinking originally, but instead, Bane. Cause, like, duh? I mean, all these villains are all juiced up like they're on Venom. Who else was it gonna be? Also, this whole gauntlet of supervillains thing is a bit reminiscent of Nightfall, the story that introduced Bane. But hey, maybe you're a new reader and don't know much about Batman history. In which case, probably absolutely none of this has made any sense whatsoever. Sorry. But at least we got to stare at some lady's butt a lot, so, you know, that's fun. Batman runs away from Bane, finally finding Poison Ivy, who Bane was apparently keeping held captive in a jar like you do. He frees her, and she informs him of the antidote to Bane's new drug, the only caveat being that Bane has to ingest it for it to work, if it proves to do anything at all. So Batman goes to confront Bane once again, which mostly just involves Bane beating the crap out of him. Luckily, the Flash, who had finally managed to burn the venom out of his bloodstream thanks to Superman's help, shows up just in time to force feed Bane the antidote, and Batman proceeds to just kick Bane off a cliff where he falls into the sea like he's the heroine from a gothic romance. Except, he won't die. Instead, he'll show up again in Talon preparing for an invasion we'll see in Arkham War. I've covered those already. This arc ends with the revelation that, gas, Jaina is the White Rabbit after all. Just maybe not in the way you might expect. It seems she can make a copy of herself, I guess? I wish I could tell you more, but... Again, she doesn't really come back again. So instead, we'll move on to our next story, where something is killing the children. Oh, no, sorry, just kidnapping them, actually. And then conducting fear experiments on them before finally releasing them as a broken, empty shell. Batman visits the most recent victim, who will not even talk anymore, so he just sits with her for a while and gives her his hand for comfort which is a very sweet moment, and I love how it's brilliantly contrasted with Batman's distant and cold relationship that he has with his own son. Your bat dad kinda sucks, Damien. This mysterious figure, with his sewn shut lips and his physician's head mirror, that is referred to as the Hollow Man by both the man hired by the villain to kidnap children for him, and by the most recent victim, is of course Scarecrow. They don't keep that mystery for very long, and it was pretty obvious from the start anyway. Who else is gonna conduct fear experiments? Scarecrow also kidnaps Commissioner Gordon, but Batman is able to track that down quickly when he realizes that the spelling of Hollow Man was a license. 
license plate. And this is why you should never get a vanity license plate. But it works out for Scarecrow because it turns out this was all a trap anyway. And Batman falls under it like an amateur, leaving him to be Scarecrow's latest experiment. Well, one of them anyway. Scarecrow has also kidnapped another little girl who is the best part of the entire arc, maybe of the entire book honestly. Seriously, she's adorable. Scarecrow does his best to be threatening and terrifying towards her, but she just reacts with a heartbreakingly large amount of understanding and sympathy. When she hears him stutter, she tells him that it's okay to stutter and that she used to have a problem with stuttering as well. She promises to be his friend even if he lets her go and even somehow manages to draw him an adorable picture of them hanging out together. Oh my god, why are you so cute little girl? You're breaking my heart kiddo! It seems her sweetness also stabs straight to the heart of Scarecrow, largely because it reminds him of his own past, giving us a glimpse into the New 52 origin for the Scarecrow. When Jonathan Crane was a boy, his mom died, and his father became obsessed with fear. Father Crane would lock his own son into a creepy basement filled with terrifying things, monitoring his reactions and taking notes that would eventually allow Jonathan to create a fear toxin. But Papa was a heavy smoker, clearly also sick and dying. And during one of these horrible experiments, he would simply kill over dead, leaving Jonathan to be found by the police, possibly days later, still locked in the creepy basement. Crane goes on to follow in his father's creepy footsteps, obsessing over the psychology of fear. As a professor at a university, he offers to help a female student overcome her fear of spiders through habituation. But I'm pretty sure habituation doesn't mean dumping an entire box of spiders on a person without warning, John John. Cheesy creasy. This is why women choose the bear over men every time. Is that enough of a meme yet to make sense? Okay. Crane tries to move on to private practice, but that just ends up driving him to insanity. Um, more insanity. Leading him into becoming the modern scarecrow we all know and love. Or whatever. Batman is also being tortured by his nightmares of his past, especially with Crane using a newer fear toxin he's developed from all his research on the children. But being Batman, he simply pushes through it and manages to get himself free. Disoriented, he gets injured by Scarecrow's super awesome scythe, seriously that thing's badass, and leaves the girl behind while he stumbles away. He even ends up needing to be rescued by Damien from just some regular street thugs. Batman's escape caused a gas leak and it ends up being Scarecrow himself who rescues the little girl, tossing her from the building before it can explode. When the police question her in an attempt to learn Scarecrow's goal, she doesn't have much in the way of answers. But we do see that the experience has brought her stutter back out, which is a really nice attention to detail and so, so tragic. Crow's plan was to crop dust the city in his new extra powerful fear gas. Yet another scenario from the Arkham games, but since this came out first, I guess maybe, you know, that one's the reference? And it drives the population mad, even creating a zombie Santa Claus? Not sure why that happened, but are you even a comic worth reading if you don't have a zombie Santa Claus? I mean, really? Despite Batman still being injured from his escape attempt, he heads out into the city to try and deal with this situation, and quickly realizes that since he was already exposed to this version of the fear gas, his blood contains the defenses needed to fight it off. So he hooks himself up to equipment that actively drains his blood to mix it with some formula that provides the necessary counter agent to overcome the toxin, and then flies around Gotham, spreading his cure in a gaseous form, which is absolutely insane. This nearly kills him, of course, especially since Bats makes Damien promise not to return the Bat plane until the city has been saved, which is a super messed up thing to ask of your own kid. But Alfred and Damien, of course, manage to restart his heart. Like with all New 52 comics, there's a zero issue here that serves as a flashback, this one showing Bruce's obsession as a young man as he looks for the conspiracy behind his parents' murders. Only to discover that, in the end, there was no conspiracy and it was just done by Joe Chill, who's just a sad, drunk old man who only wanted money for more booze and nothing more. 
we move on from here to a story about the Mad Hatter. Hatter has been kidnapping people from all over Gotham and taking them to an abandoned missile silo that he's converted into his new base of operations. There he makes them do things like dress in outfits and recite lines, and if they fail their audition, Hatter just straight up kills them. He also has a number of others around that just seem to be building something for him, but it's initially unclear what that something is. Just like with Scarecrow, we'll be getting a new origin for Hatter, whose obsession also goes back to his childhood. Jervis Tetch was the son of a haberdasher. That's a fancy old-timey name for a hat maker. Jervis grew obsessed with a girl from his school, whose name, as you can probably guess, was Alice. Despite being small and weird, he worked up the courage to ask her out, and they spent a day at this pretty wild Wonderland theme park. That actually seems like a pretty cool park, to be honest. That day would be permanently ingrained in Hatter's memory as a perfect day. But as the kids grew older, Alice would grow less interested in him and more interested in conventionally attractive boys. Desiring to compensate for his lack of testosterone, Hatter begins taking pills. But those pills bring out his psychosis. And before long, he's losing his hair, his teeth are getting messed up, and he's becoming violent. His parents eventually put him in a mental institution, but he'd eventually grow into the Hatter personality that we have now, which is the person kidnapping people to rebuild the Wonderland Park he visited as a kid with Alice. Wanting to relive the perfect day of his memories, he goes to visit his Alice, who is still alive here, but married, tired, and aged. No longer the youthful beauty that he remembers. So he kills her because of course he does. This means he needs to find a replacement Alice, and I bet you'll never guess where he finds it. Mostly because I haven't told you about this character yet. Since the start of Hurwitz's run, Batman has more or less been dating a Ukrainian concert pianist named Natalia Trusevich. She was just meant to be one of his disposable excuse girls, but she was smart and talented and interesting, and Bruce found himself falling for her. But while she likes him too, she can't stand his distance and lies, and she breaks up with him. What's not mentioned here is that around this time, Damien dies, and perhaps spurred by that, Bruce decides that he regrets losing Natalia. So eventually he goes to her and shares his secret with her. That's right, he reveals that he's Batman. He shows her his Bat Cave. He shows her his Bat Plane. That's not a euphemism. Get your mind out of the gutter. Okay, it was a euphemism as well. You got me. He's so in love that he gets a little careless with his secret, dropping Natalia off at one of her concerts as Batman, and that gets the attention of Mad Hatter, who checks in on this mysterious woman and immediately declares her perfect. Because of course he does. Because of course he does. So Hatter kidnaps Natalia, because again, of course he does, and attempts to take her through his nightmare in Wonderland. But Natalia is Ukrainian tough and refuses to play along with his sick games. She also fully expects Batman will find her and save her, up to and including the point that Hatter, finally sick of her refusal to play along or tell him Batman's secret identity, pushes her out of a helicopter. And she falls down and lands on the bat signal. That's messed up. Bats felt her like we're felling Ukraine right now. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. It's a shame about Natalia, but she does get one additional appearance in an alternate reality from Detective Comics number 27, where Batman is shown a world where he has everything he wants, including his parents still alive and Natalia as his wife. And Damien suspiciously missing, but you know. Anyway, enraged now, Batman finally tracks Hatter down to his hideout and begins just kicking down doors and breaking Tweedledee's jaw. Something the goon had actually been complaining about Batman doing to him at an earlier point, and Batman had at that point promised he'd just do it again if he ever found Tweedle on the wrong side of the law. So, promise kept. Batman then nearly loses himself on the Hatter, nearly beating the villain to death, only stopping himself at the last moment. Our next story focuses on Clayface, and just like with the others so far, we're given a new origin for him. Seems young Basil Carlo was bothered by how ordinary and boring he was. In an effort to stand out from the crowd, he becomes an actor, but 
can't land any rolls. Desperate, he eventually goes to Penguin, who gives him some magical ancient clay. The clay takes over his body, allowing him to remold his features to make himself whatever he wants to be, and suddenly he's turned himself into a big movie star. But before long, he loses control of his ability to shift, and Penguin starts calling him in as an enforcer, which leads to his eventual life of crime as a supervillain. The present day plot for this story is a continuation of Clayface's appearance in Snyder's New 52 Batman, with Clayface now able to almost fully become someone else. He starts by kidnapping Gordon and going about robbing banks as the commissioner, until Jim manages to free himself and use a spotlight to create an impromptu bat signal, leading Batman to his rescue. They eventually capture Clayface by going all three amigos on him and tricking him out into the open by having a bunch of cops dress up as Batman, and then capturing him in the same kind of cage they used to catch him in the Snyder story. I'm not a big fan of the art for this story, but I do absolutely love how Clayface looks while they're flying him away to prison. So grumpy. Following this, we get a brief couple of stories that are, for some reason, completely textless. They tell a story of a woman who decides to move to America in search of a better life after her newborn baby dies, only to end up getting caught up in a human trafficking ring while her daughter is forced into a sweatshop. Batman eventually shuts the ring down and saves them both, but I'm not really sure the point of this story or what point or emotional beat is supposed to be served by it being textless. I guess it could be attempting to reflect the difficulty of the language barrier, but I don't really know that not including text at all was the best way to achieve that goal here. I try to be positive on comic creators trying different things, but this one just really doesn't work for me. Our final story focuses on The Man Bat. This time we're getting a sequel to the Man Bat stories we saw in Detective Comics. Man Bat, or something like it, has returned to Gotham, only Kirk Langstrom swears it's not him or his wife. Actually, he just swears it's not him. Not sure what happened to Francine exactly, but Batman doesn't even look into her as an option. The mystery of who this is isn't left for more than a page though, as we're immediately told that the new man bat is actually Kirk's father, Abraham Langstrom, who exists apparently. Abe is a billionaire industrialist owner of Patriarch Pharmaceuticals, cause we're going all biblical here. And he apparently bought up all the man bat serum in the world, including out from under Talia al Ghul and Francine Langstrom, so they do at least remember that she exists. He then had a team of scientists work on the man bat serum to refine it, turning him into an even more powerful bat creature than we're used to, with more control over his mind. But while Abe might not be as out of control as a regular man bat, he still likes the hunt. He likes drinking the blood of people, and so he's focused on doing that to the homeless, believing that nobody would miss them. But that makes him a target for Batman. Batman can't inject Bat Abe with a cure directly as his man bat skin is too thick. So instead, he injects himself with the cure and waits for Abe to attack a homeless shelter, then presents himself as the target. When Abe drinks Batman's blood, he's reverted back to his human self. You're finding a lot of solutions that require draining yourself of blood there, B-Man. Beginning to think you have some kind of weird kink. Being a rich man though, Abe is of course able to get all charges dropped. And the comic ends with the promise that he'll be back as the man bat, but that Batman will be watching for him. And if that repeat conflict ever happens, you know I'll cover it. But for now, we'll just get to the breakdown. The New 52 was overpacked with Batman comics, so this series really needed to do something different in order to stand out. And honestly, I think it achieved that. I really like that Hurwitz decided to focus on Batman's rogues gallery, taking us through updated origins for them that really focused on storytelling and humanity and emotional beats. Not that all the stories are winners, I don't like the magical Native American clay becoming part of Clayface's origin, and I'm not a big fan of the new Man Bat story. Also, honestly, though this was sort of started as basically a David Finch career vehicle, his run I feel was pretty underwhelming. 
at least in terms of the writing that he did for us. Even working with comics veteran Paul Jenkins didn't particularly save that opening volley. But the comic really did shine its brightest under Hurwitz. I appreciated the sense of humor he brought to the comic, though I didn't really mention it earlier than this, and it's honestly a shame his Mad Hatter origin was pretty much completely undone almost immediately following this in Detective Comics with that honestly not particularly interesting anarchy story. So overall, I'm giving this series a recommendation level of... Medium. It's a perfectly fine series that I don't see any reason to skip if you're reading through New 52 comics, but I also can't say it's entirely worth going out of your way for, either. The collected editions get... 1. Used Needle of Man Bat Serum 1. Box of Magical Clay 1. Scarecrow Surgical Mirror and 1. Mad Hatter's Hat that's moving from bad to good, with the hat getting the best because I like hats. I'm mad about hats. Anyway, that breaks down like this. Let's go from worst to best. Volume 3 is approximately the shortest at 6 regular issues and 1 annual, but it contains no other bonuses. Volume 4 is 8 issues and absolutely nothing else. Volume 2 is 1 issue less at 7 issues, but it has some bonus pencil artwork from David Finch, and I gotta give it extra credit for that. Finally, Volume 1 is an entire 9 issues, plus more pencil pages from Finch, so it gets the biggest reward. Nothing super impressive here, but overall acceptable collections. Thanks everybody for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Believe it or not, there's still plenty more New 52 Batman to come. I was not kidding about there being way too much Batman in the New 52. Or not enough Batman, I guess it depends on how much Batman you want. The point is, there's a lot. So if you did like this video, or you've liked some of my other videos, or you're just a cool person, or you're looking forward to what's coming next, then make sure to hit the like and the subscribe and all of those things so you can be sure to be here next time, and I hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.